Okay, so in this small segment, we're going to talk about goodness of fit test using a favorite distribution of ours, the chi-square distribution. We saw the chi-square distribution in chapter 11 when we were testing for variance and standard deviation. We saw the chi-square distribution again when we were testing for that nasty thing called heteroscedasticity. Now we see it yet one more time. Okay, so when we talk about goodness of fit, we so said goodness of fit relative to what? Okay, so many times we see this chi-squared test or chi-squared distribution test for determining whether what we have follows a certain distribution, whether it's checking to see if household incomes are normally distributed, if prices normally distributed, demand normally distributed, waiting time exponentially distributed. We can use this goodness of fit test to check to see if things are following the distribution we expected it to see. We see it in gambling a lot of times, right? whether it's VLTs, whether it's Lotto 649s, there's always a calibration to make sure that the distribution that those uh, systems are operating on are indeed the distributions we expect. Profit margins, profit amounts, collection amounts are all dependent on the fact that that particular VLT or whatever gaming machine you may be looking at follows a certain distribution so that, you know, with a law of large numbers, with enough or uh, with a big enough sample size, we can pretty much predict our profitability with a very small amount of, of variability. So that's very, very important. Okay. So essentially, what we are doing here is we are comparing what we actually got. So we've got observations with what we would have expected to get. The closer those are to each other, the tighter the fit. The further the way they are from each other, so if we get a different number in reality than we expected, then perhaps our observation is not following the distribution we thought it was following. Okay? So at the end of the day, all we are doing is comparing what we actually got the observed with what we expected, okay? depending on the distribution. Each distribution has its level of how much we expect. Okay, fancy word time. Multinomial probability distribution just means that every observed item in a sample must fall into one of K categories. And so K becomes a key measurement for us. So it falls into certain categories. The probability that you fall into the category depends on P1, P2, up to PK. You know? Probability falling in category 1 is P1. Probability falling in category 2 is P2, and on and on and on, until you run out of categories. So samples are. Um, and independent selections from the population where each outcome must be one of those possibilities. So we only have those possibilities. And so now what we're trying to do here is after we've classified everything into certain groups or into cells, we count how much we get in each one of those groups, right? The frequency, which we denote by small letter F, little subscript I, F1, actual frequency in, in group one, F2, the actual frequency in group two, F3, the actual frequency in group three, and so on. So we have our actual expect our actual observed number, our observed frequencies in each of our groups. Okay. And so we had a nice little table looks like that, right? Everybody's got the little group and how many are in a little group we were counting up stuff like we we're in kindergarten or something like that. Okay, very exciting. Okay, so that's what we actually have. That's what our data shows us. We, we did the measurements, we did the surveys. This is what we get. And um, so now we think, oh, what we should have, what, what, what we should have gotten, right? What were we expecting to get? So what were we expecting? What probability were we were expecting to be in in group one? What probability were we expecting to be in group two, and so on? So now we need to come up with all these expected frequencies. And a common sort of uh, way we find expected values. We were saying, are you in this group? Or are you not in this group? How many in this group? How many in that group? How many in that group? We think back to our wonderful, wistful days in our very first stats class, when we were talking about the binomial probability. Ah, so those expected frequencies can be determined by the binomial probability. Right? How do you find an expected value in the probability? 
in a binomial probability? Just take the number of observations in total and multiply it by the probability you would expect that to be in that category. Easy, right? Easy. Little tiny formula there. We've seen it before. Wasn't scary the first time. Not scary now. Okay. And so now we set up all these expected probabilities. You know, expected probability uh, E1. You know, what we'd expect to see in, in group one. Right? How many would we expect to see in group one? So N sample size times by the probability of being in group one. The probability being... If we were following the distribution, we expect it to follow the probability, by the way. Okay. Okay, so now, where does the chi-squared come from? So, Gallery chi-squared formula right, looks the same as most of our chi-squared formulas. It's got some squared thing going on in the, on the, in the numerator, summing up a bunch of things. So, essentially, what we are doing is we are taking the observed number in each particular group. Observed number, for instance, in group one, minus what we would expect to be in group one if it followed the distribution, if this data followed the distribution we expected it to follow. We square it. That's where the chi-squared part comes in, right? Chi-squared's always got something being squared. And then divided by the number we would have expected. We do that for every single group. Okay, that's where the big sigma comes in. That's where that big summation symbol comes in. For each group, four groups, we're doing that calculation four times, adding them all together to get the chi-square distribution. Little bit of labor, but not really hard math here. Little bit of labor, though. Now, we know that with a chi-square distribution, there's this other piece of information that we need to know. Well, what is that other piece of information? The degrees of freedom, okay? So when we talk about that degrees of freedom, okay, it's the number of categories. How many groups do you have? K minus one, there's your degrees of freedom. If you had four groups, four minus one, three, your degrees of freedom is three. We know with our extensive experience with chi-square distributions, uh, degrees of freedom, very important to us, okay? So again, what are we trying to do here? We want to compare what we see, what we got, what's from our data, it's from our measurements, to what we would expect if HO were true, i.e. your data followed the expected distribution, followed the distribution you thought it followed. If there's not a, if it's a big small number, then those differences between what you observe and what you expect to be very small, and we'd expect that chi-squared test statistic to be a very small number. Chi-squared test statistic gets to become really big, and there starts to become a big difference between what you got and what you thought you were going to get. And with that big difference comes a small p-value. Not much difference comes a large p-value. Large p-value, we wouldn't reject h naught. Small p-value, we do reject h naught. H naught being, hey, well, distribution we thought it follows is the distribution it follows. So intuitively, it all makes sense. By the way, marketing people love this stuff. Love doing this thing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the test structure. Uh, so HO is that it follows, uh, well, fancy words, multinomial distribution with the specified probabilities for each of the K categories. <sighs> Good thing I don't have COVID, otherwise I'd be sucking there like you wouldn't believe on that. Essentially, it just means if it follows the distribution and we think this is the probability that that would be in group one, this is the probability it would be group two, this is the probability it would be group three. Okay, So well, HO could be that each group could have its own separate probability value. Of course, they all got to add up to one, but they could be each there separate. Now, HA words, no way to express this in nice, clean mathematical language. Just says, hey, it doesn't follow that distribution specified in HO. Whatever you put in HO, nah, doesn't follow that one. I don't know which one it follows, but it don't follow that one. Okay, so just the population doesn't follow the distribution uh, with the specified probabilities for each of the key categories. Okay, so that one's just boilerplate words. Step two, alpha, usual, always. Step three, 
chi-square test statistic, what are the degrees of freedom, number of categories minus one, boom, standard step three stuff. Step four, now we go through either using the tables or using Excel, find the p-value. Compare that p-value to alpha using the same rule we've been using all term, and then a concluding sentence. Does it follow the distribution? Uh, does it not follow this particular distribution? Whatever is whatever's relevant. Remember, we can try to make that concluding sentence as close to something that, uh, you know, uh, regular people can understand, i.e. minimize that stat speak. Okay, so example number one. Uh, I will do uh, some examples here on the PowerPoint presentation where the, the examples are kind of split out. And then I will have a separate file where I will just do questions. Uh, it's just easier to do that. Uh, screen in screen sometimes works for some people and sometimes does not work for some people. Okay. So the Bulletville Watch Company wishes to determine whether there are any color preferences for watch bands. A random sample of 80 customers indicated the following preferences. And we see that there in the table. Is there evidence of a color preference? Okay. Well, if there's no color preference, what would be the probability of each one of those colors? Well, the probability would be the same, right? I mean, if I don't care if it's tan or maroon or brown or black, then my probability of selecting tan or maroon or black is going to be the same, right? Kind of makes sense. Okay. So in that case, well, four groups, probability all the same, uh, one out of four. Right? So HO is that P1 equals P2 equals P3 equals P4 equals a quarter or 0.25. HA, ah, there is a preference for one or more of those colors. More colors have different probabilities of being preferred. Right? HH is, then, is just the opposite of HO. Right? If you have no color preference, HA must be that you have a color preference. Alpha, whatever. Alpha is whatever is specified in the question or whatever you determine is appropriate as the researcher. We got our test statistic. There's our formula. We plug our formula, pull it off the formula sheet or wherever, and we see that we had observed for group one, we observed 12. But if there was no difference, n minus p1, 80 people, n is 80, times by the probability of p1 of 0.25, 80 times 0.25 equals to 20. So probability or the num the expected number we would get in each group is 20 right? n times by its probability now we're not always testing to see if the groups are the same or different right that again the p1 the p2 p3 can be set to be whatever in this case they just happen to be the same because it's an easy example to start out with so we have 12 minus 20 for the group number one, squared it, divided by the expected value of 20, and we just basically rinse and repeat. Do the same thing for the values related to group two, then do the same thing for the values related to group three, do the same thing for the value related to group four. Notice that we have done this calculation for each and every one of those groups. Do that calculation a lot, we get the 30.4. We race to Excel or we race to the tables, whichever uh, tool that's relevant for you at that particular moment, and we find the p-value. The p-value is that we get a test statistic at least as much as the 30.4 that we calculated. Go and If you were looking up in tables, which is uh, the way I've approached it here, we would find that the on the degrees of freedom of 3, the largest number across that row is 12.838. That would indicate a probability or a p-value of 0 0.005. Our 30.4 is bigger than that. So we're going to have a p-value or an area to the right of less than 0 0.005. If the area to the right is 12.838 uh, is 0 0.05. So if the area to the right of 12.838 is 0 0.005, the area to the right of 30.4 is going to be smaller. So using just the tables, we find that the p-value is just less than 0 0.005. Don't know what it exactly is when I use tables. If I'm using Excel, I can find 
the exact p-value, right? And we've talked about that when we talked about heteroscedasticity, and we talked about that when we talked about tests for variance and tests for standard deviation earlier on. Nevertheless, that very, very teeny tiny p-value is less than any reasonable alpha. Therefore, we reject H0. And uh, what's our conclusion? Well, we have, we have sufficient evidence to uh, suggest or to support that not all wristband colors are equally preferred. There is evidence of a color preference. So just again, just to restate, we start off our process, same as, uh, as always. We have a hypothesis, we have our alpha, we have the test statistic, the p-value, the decision, and the conclusion. Right? And nothing, no difference, nothing unique with this particular test other than that. A couple of things that uh, we need to keep in mind when we do these chi-squared goodness of fit tests is the sample size has to be large enough so that each category has an expected frequency of at least five, i.e. EI, one or E2 or E3 or E4, whatever, is at least five. The test is not valid in any category, has an expected frequency less than one. So we prefer at least five. We must have at least one. What happens if uh, we don't have five? Well, when we merge categories, right? Think of days of the week. We have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We could go with a uh, Monday, Friday, you know, end of the weeks, end of beginning of the week, middle of the week, whatever, whatever, whatever grouping makes sense. We start to bundle them up. Right. And you kind of see this when you're doing your uh, group projects and you're working uh, in with your data sets and you go, oh, man, oh, I have to group some things together because I just don't have enough observations to do a dummy variable for everything. I have to cluster things a little bit. No different here. Okay. Sometimes you have to cluster. And that is the end of the show.